Okay, so we talked about bars, and bars, as I, as I said, it, um, it only takes axial load. So for axial load, we can model this as a screen. So something like this, and each one of these has a, has a stiffness, like K1, K2, K1, K2, right? And we talked about element stiffness matrix and a structure stiffness matrix. And there's a complete difference between these. Element stiffness matrix, we assuming are, is the element is free in the air, like is free. And then we try to figure out what if this element has six degrees of freedom, like three here and three here. We fix all the degrees of freedom and release only one degree of freedom and put a unit load and find the resistance of this element to this unit load. Once you find the resistance, this is the stiffness because we know from Hawkes law that B is equal to K multiplied by delta. So if we put delta equal to one here and find the resistance or find the forces in this structure, this force is gonna be equal to the stiffness so we can get the stiffness. And we did it one by one. Like we put a unit load here and in degree of freedom number one and solve that structure and in degree of freedom number two and we get the stiffness matrix of each one of these elements. And then we talked about how, we ca how can we build the element, the structural stiffness matrix from the element of stiffness matrix. Like, like last time, like if we have, for example, something like this, structure like this, and it's fixed here, fixed here, first we find the degrees of freedom, like here, U1, U2. Since this, is the degrees of freedom for entire structure. So we will have a structure stiffness matrix that is two by two, but where should I put here? You should to figure out what is the element of stiffness matrix and how you combine them together. Actually, it will be like this element is gonna be like two by two, something like this. And this element is gonna be two by two, something like this. And this element gonna be two by two, something like this. And all of them are sharing the element here, like here was, so there is no degrees of freedom, but here there is U1, and here U2, U1, U2, zero. So they get combined together and they make up the structure stiffness matrix. So why we, why we want to find out the stiffness matrix of an element or a structure, we, we need to find out this so that we can expand this law, this Hawkes law, from just to one degree of freedom to multiple degrees of freedom. Like this one can be expanded to the force F total as a vector equal to the structure stiffness matrix as a vector multiplied by <clears throat> the displacement. So this is force equal to stiffness multiplied by displacement. Same like this one, same thing, all right? So if we find the structure stiffness matrix, and if I know the loads, because the force is the loads of the structure. Same thing, like if you have a bar, you have loads, and this load, if you know the stiffness of this element, you will know how this element is gonna be formed. Like I put one time, this element make like this. Knowing the stiffness of this member, what do I mean by stiffness? You need, you know, like the, the characteristic, the physical characteristic of this one. What is the Young's modulus? What is the moment of inertia? What is the cross-section area? What is the length? All this information is gonna tell you what is the stiffness, what is the rigidity of this element. Once you know them, and you know the loads on this element, you know how this element is gonna react to external loads. And I, what I mean by how to react, I mean like what is the deformation, like the uh, X deformation, the Y deformation, the rotational deformation, whatever deformation that we are looking at. So usually we have the forces, we build the stiffness matrix, and then we get the deformation. Once you get the deformation, you can know the forces in each one of these members. Once we know, if we know U1, if we know U2, then we use the small version of these. What is it? F total on a member is equal to K, K is the element, the stiffness matrix, multiplied by the deformation on this member. So in this for member, so this is for structure, and this is for member. 
once, so the first one, the first equation, I use it when once I build a structure stiffness matrix to get the deformation. Once you know the deformation on your entire structure, you can use it to get member forces. What is the force in this member? What is the force in this member? So right now, once I know you, I put you here. And I know the K, so I can get the force in each member. Okay? <clears throat> and by the way, I mean by F total all the forces on the structure, like the nodal forces, F nodal, the vector, minus the fixed end forces. And I told you minus because the fixed end forces are not loads, are reactions. So it needs to be negative so that we can convert them to loads. All right, so this is just a summary of what we did last time, and this is the general idea of the stiffness uh, method. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about trusses. So what I'm gonna do right now, I'm gonna show you how we develop a stiffness matrix for a truss member. This are bars, this is not trusses, okay? It's a special case for trusses. But let's see what, what will happen with trusses. All right, so if I have a truss like this, and there is a hinge here, and there is a roller here. Okay, first thing, any structure that we need to solve using the stiffness method, you need to tell me what are the degrees of freedom. So for this structure, do you guys remember the degrees of freedom of this truss? How many degrees of freedom this truss have considering that these two members are not connected, like they are away from each other, like they are not one member? How many degrees of freedom I have for the truss? How many degrees of freedom each joint can have in truss? Like at this joint, what are the degrees of freedom? Two. Two, and this one, two. two. This one? One. One, so I have one, I have two, three, four, five. I have five degrees of freedom. So if I'm building the stiffness matrix of this structure, S is gonna be? Five by five. five. <clears throat> All right, let's see how is the stiffness matrix of each one of these members are gonna look like. one truss member from this structure, something like maybe uh, this member. I take it out and to study outside. This truss member <clears throat> is gonna be something like this, this joint and this joint. And any truss member has four degrees of freedom. It has one, U1, U2, U3, U4. Usually we name the horizontal degrees of freedom first, and then we name the Y degrees of freedom. And we started from the left to the right. This is how we name the degrees of freedom. And since the trust member has two degrees of freedom, you'll tell me, okay, but the bars has two degrees of freedom. Has only like U1 here and U2 here. Why there is not Y? Because far as this only the forces is coming this way. So the bar is either moving in negative x or positive x, but the truss, it can have like, it can move x and it can move y. So it has two degree of freedom at each joint. Okay, so how about the member stiffness matrix for a truss? K okay. for a truss is gonna be four by four, right? <clears throat> because I have two here and two here. So it's gonna be something like this. And usually when we name it like it's gonna be four by four because I have four degrees of freedom. <coughs> Excuse me. So usually the degrees of freedom are like this. Here I have K11 and then K12 K13, K14. So the first number is the row number, and the second number is the column number. So here it's gonna be starting by K21, K22, K23, 
K full four, then K thirty one, thirty two, thirty three, thirty four, thirty four one, thirty four two, thirty four three, thirty four four. This is how this difference matrix is going to look like. But let's find out what is the values of these numbers. If you want to find each one of these columns or each one of these rows, because the columns and the rows are the same. So you will have here U1, this is related to U2, related to U3, related to U4. So if you want to find out column number one that related to U1, as I told you last time, you take this member like this, and it has four degrees of freedom. Close all the degrees of freedom, fix all of them. So I'm gonna fix these, restrain all the degrees of freedom, and restrain all the degrees of freedom here. Then next, since we are talking about U1, you will do like unit deformation at degree of freedom number one. So I'm gonna make U1 is equal to one, while all the other degrees of freedom are equal to zero. To zero. And then find out the value of the fixed forces. Okay, so this is a thrust member. If you want to move this point, like this is my thrust member, it's fix it here, fix it here. And you, you hold this fixation part, you are pushing it to make unit deformation, like one millimeter or one centimeter. So the forces that you are gonna have, do you guys remember? The stiffness, right? Okay, so let me ask you, do you know what is the force is gonna be here? It's the stiffness, okay. What is the value of K for an axial? Um, like if I have a spring, do you guys remember? EA over, e over, e over L. L. So it's gonna be EA over L. And then I'm gonna have a reaction here, EA over L, right? How about the vertical forces? What are the values? Zeros, right? Okay, so let's find out what are these in terms of these. Okay, so K11 is the stiffness at degree of freedom one due to a unit deformation at one. So this is K11. This is degree of freedom number two. So this is this is called K21. Why, what is this? D is stiffness at direction or at degree of freedom number two due to unit load or unit deformation at U1. Then you have here, this is K31, the stiffness at degree of freedom number three, the U2, a unit load U1, and this is K41. This is equal to zero, this is equal to zero, but K11, we know it. Let's do the same thing. So right now I got the first column, so let's get the second column. The second, to find the second column, I need to put unit deformation in the direction of U2. So U2 is up, so I need to put unit deformation up like this. U2 equals one. By the way, this is not a fixation. This is a hinge because I'm restraining X and Y direction. When I restrain translation, I, I restrain X direction. And this is a thrust member. Everything is hinges, there is no fixation. Okay, so if you have a thrust member, and it's a hinge here and hinge here, if you move this end like this, they will not develop any internal forces because it can, it can rotate. So if you want to go this up, you can go this up. It doesn't rotate. But if this is a fixation and you want to move this up, it's gonna make an internal forces because bending moment is gonna be developed. So U2 equal to one up is not gonna develop any forces. So all the forces is gonna be equal to zero. Like the forces here is gonna be zero. The force here is gonna be zero. Same thing here, same thing here. All of them are gonna be equal to zero. But let's find which case are this one. This K is the K at degree of freedom number one, like this one. But the second number is unit deformation at two. And this is K22. How about this one? This is K3, but what is the, the other number? 
three, two, because then it's Hamisha Filch, and here is K four two. And all of them are equal to zero. Why? As I told you, like if they if they are both hinges, like they can rotate. Like if I take this up, it's gonna go up without developing any internal forces. But if I put unit deformation here and the other one is restrained, so it's gonna develop an axial force. Okay, let's get to uh, number three. So number three is something like this. I'm gonna put a unit deformation, by the way, we put the unit deformation in the positive way. What is the positive way? U3 is this way positive, so I'm gonna put U3 this direction equal to one. And if I did it, what is gonna happen? I need a force here. And if the, this force here is gonna be EA over L, and on the other direction, there will be EA, EA over L, something like this. And the vertical forces are equal to zero. So if I wanna find this one, how about this one? What is the K value of this one? What is the uh, subscript? K, one three. One three, excellent. How about here? Two three. Two three. Here, three three. Four three now. All right, uh, then <clears throat> I have here the last one. The last one I'm gonna put U4 equal to one out like this. So all the developed forces is gonna be zero because it's like the same as U2. So, okay, so this is gonna be K14, K24, K3, 4, K4, 4. So finally, if I want to write the stiffness matrix, K of a truss member is gonna be K11, so it's gonna be EA over L, zero, negative EA over L, and I have zeros, and then negative EA over L, zero, EA over L, zero, and all zeros. How did I get this? The first one is coming from here. EA over L, zero, and this one is negative because it goes on the other direction. All these is gonna be zeros, and this one, the first one is negative, K13, EA over L, and then zero, and then positive EA over L, by the way, the diagonals of the stiffness matrix is always positive, it never gets positive, it never gets negative. Why? Because the same thing that we did here. If the deformation is in the positive direction, so definitely the stiffness or the force that causes this deformation is in the same direction. It's not in the other direction. It's never that the deformation is here and the force is going the other way, okay? And usually the stiffness matrix of a member, it's always symmetric. Like here, so we'll find negative EA over L, negative EA over L, zero, zero, stuff like this. This is very important because there might be a question in the exam asking you to build the stiffness matrix of a truss. So I need to see all that. I need to see this one, this one, this one, this one, this matrix, and this matrix, okay? okay. This is for a truss member. How about if we want to <clears throat> If we want to develop the stiffness matrix of um, a frame, Let's see, frames. All right, frames are much way more complicated. How? Okay, so if I have a frame member a part of a structure, like my structure, for example, like something like this. How many degrees of freedom this frame member has? Six. Six, right? What are they? Uh, U1. U1. U2. U2. What is the third one? Rotation. Rotation, right? U3. Same thing here. U4. U5. U6, 
If I went to build this the element of stiffness matrix for this member, I need to do the same thing degree of freedom by degree of freedom. But the good thing that can help me, you want a new four are easy. Now, okay, let's do, let's do you want, okay. <clears throat> so first, the K is gonna be six by six. Six by six. Then I have U1, U2, U3, U4, U5, U6. And it's gonna have something like that. And I need to find six elements for the matrix. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, how can I find them? Okay, you have your member, something like this. What is the steps? What should I do? I fix all the degrees of freedom. And right now, this is gonna be fixation because I have rotation. Once you restrain rotation, that means there's a fi it's a fixed. Yeah, so, yeah, and then I have fixations like this, and I start one by one. I put a unit deformation in the direction of U1. So U1 is gonna be something, U1 is equal to one. By the way, do you guys remember, we proved how did we get EA over L, right, last time. Do you guys remember how did we get it? You guys remember we used the stress strain relationship like we used the relationship that the Young's model was equal to the stress over the strain or the stress equal to E multiplied by the strain. We know that this is equal B over area and this is E and this is delta over L. Okay, so this is the strain, this is the stress and we did some arrangement like we said that from this, B is gonna be equal to E A over L multiplied by delta. So E A over L multiplied by delta. So this is similar to the rule B equal to K multiplied by delta. So K is equal to E A over L, right? You can do the same thing using the concept of virtual work. How? Like for this one, if you want to find the, the internal forces that result from U1 equal to one. I believe I have a proof here. Let me let me do it for you. So, so for this one, if you like, let's see. Let's write it here. Number one. We need to find the normal stiffness. Okay. If you guys remember how to solve virtual work, because the exam is on Monday, so you, you should be able to do that. Like here is your problem. I'm telling you, you having a truss, and this truss doesn't have any load, but it has displacement U1 equal to one unit load here. The first thing that you should do is that you will have, this is an indeterminate structure, right? So you'll choose a main system that is determinant and stable. So I'm gonna remove this Fixation. So this is my main system. Okay, it's determinant and stable. And then I'm gonna apply a unit. I'm gonna apply a unit force in the direction of the deformation. So I'm gonna apply a unit load this direction, like one ton. All right. So this is how I solve indeterminate structure using the concept of virtual work. You have a main system has the loads and has everything. You clear all, all the loads, like these are the direct loads, like unit load or distributed load or even displacement. I remove that. And then I choose a main system that is determined and stable. And then I put a unit load in the direction of the removed redundance because I want to get, what is the value of the reaction here? I don't know the value of the reaction here. Like here, I know that there is a reaction B and here the reaction B. We all know that this B is EA over L, but we want to find it out with the concept of virtual work. So to find this redundant, I removed it in a main system and I put a unit load in the direction of the redundant. Then what should I, what should you do? You draw the, <clears throat> the, uh, 
the internal forces diagram that comes in from the unit load and the main system. So the unit load is going to have a normal force that is constant and it's compression and it's a negative. So that would be something like this. Negative 1, negative 1, and all is negative. But the main system, this we call it the original system, and this is the virtual system, or the queue system. So this system, that if you draw the normal force on it, it's going to be zero because there's no forces. It's only displacement. So this one is totally a zero. So, <clears throat> so solving this system, you will use the same equation that we have been using. Like you will need to find out what is the value of delta 1 r and what is the value of delta 1 1. Then you substitute in the equation that says delta 1 all plus f delta 1 1 equal to delta, right? We have this equation. We need to find this one and this one. And if we found them, we will be able to solve this equation. But there is a special case about this one. Delta 1 all, if you remember, we need to integrate two bending moment or two normal force diagram with each other. I have one. This is system number one. But system number is zero. So this is zero and this is one. If I integrate this with zero, it's going to give me zero. So delta 1 O is zero. But delta 1 1, I need to integrate this system with itself. So if you go and look on the table, you will find you need to integrate a rectangle with a rectangle. And <clears throat> this is the integration of N1 with N1 over EA, and you have EL. So I get one EA outside. And I integrate N1 with N1, DL. Once you do them using the table that you have, it's going to be 1 by 1 by L. So if you, if you go to the table, it tells you you get the moment from this rectangle, it's 1. And the moment from the other rectangle, which is the same one, it's 1. And multiply it by the length, it's going to be something like this. Is it positive or negative? It's a positive. Why? Because I have this is negative one and this is negative one. So it's all will be positive. So I don't bother signs because I know that always delta one one, delta two two are always positive. So when you get them, you'll find that this is equal to L over EA. So we got delta one one. Let's substitute in this equation. Delta one only is zero plus F, the force that I want to find it here. Multiplied by delta 1, 1, which is L over EA, equal to, what is the value of delta? In most of the our problems that we solved in the lecture over the last week, the value of delta is always equal to zero. But this problem is a special, because we have already delta at 1. Like, we, when we solve, usually the support is not moving. But right now, the support is moving, which is similar to the case, do you guys remember when we have a spring? We said that we have an initial delta at the support coming that the spring is not fixed. It's moving and the delta is equal to F over K. But right now I'm telling you this support is a starting by delta equal to one. So delta is gonna be here equal to one. So if you wanna find F, F is gonna be equal to E A over L. So B is gonna be equal to E A over L. And that is the same value like this value. So solving it using the Verster principle of the relationship between stress and strain is going to give you the same answer that the virtual work is going to provide to you. You should be able to do this. Like if I came in the exam and ask you, drive the normal stiffness of a frame member, you'll have to put all of these. I need to see this, I need to see that. I need to see that you substituted in delta 1 O, delta 1 1, and get all these values. It's very, very simple. Very simple to have this. This is the problem. This is that you remove the redundance and don't be a main system that is determined and stable and put a unit load, and then you get the normal force, and then you do these integrations. Delta 1 O is zero because there is no loads on the main system. Delta 1 1 is the integration of this with itself and then you will get this value, and then you substitute in, the, in this equation, okay? So this is how we drive the normal stiffness of a frame memory.
All right, let's get to the difficult part. So the difficult part is to drive the shear stiffness. So number two. Shear stiffness. So for the shear stiffness, so I want to put U2 is equal to one. So what I mean by shear axial, axial is related to U1 and U4 because they are in the axial direction. But shear stiffness is related to U3 and U5 because this is related to these, the forces that, can, that make shear on my member. All right, so I have my member like this. I'm gonna fix all the degrees of freedom. like this and then I'm gonna put u2 is equal to 1. Once I put u2 equal to 1 I need to find all the reactions. If I count all the reactions here I will be able to get the second vector in this matrix. By the way let's write this matrix while we are working. Okay, it's gonna be a big matrix. We got the first vector. The first vector is I have a force EA over L, and then there's a reaction here, EA over L, and all the other forces are zero. Let me make it clean. So if I have U1, equal to one, so what is gonna happen? I'm gonna have here, what is the K here? K11, one, one, right? Equal to EA over L. How about the K here, what is the name of this K? K21 K21 is equal to, K21 is equal to zero, and I have K like this, K31, equal to zero. Same thing here. K41 equal to negative EA over L. K51 equal to zero. By the way, oh yeah, I got it right. And then I have K61 is equal to zero. I have all the Ks here. So the first one is EA over L, then zero, then zero, Okay, I have all the six of them. And this is U2, U1. What we are doing, we are getting U2, U2 is equal to one. Let's see how we can get it. Same thing. But here you are gonna, you should have asked me a question. You remove the fixation, the fix it from here. But you only, when you remove a fixation, the remove the redundant is three forces. It's X, Y, and moment. Why you only, get due to the axial force because the axial force is not what we call is not coupled force like if you put an axial force on a, on a member it doesn't develop moment or shear like when i put a, when i put a, a, a deformation u1 is equal to one in the axial direction it's not going to make a moment and it's not going to make a shear so that's why i didn't bother drawing the bending moment diagram or the shear force diagram because all the forces is gonna be zero because I know this one is only gonna develop an axial force. But here, <clears throat> here this one, when I make a shear, is gonna develop moment and shear, both of them, because this is gonna be bending. But there will be, there will be no any axial force because there is no axial force. Shear and moment are coupled forces. They come together hand in hand. <coughs> so let's see. I'm gonna solve it using the concept of virtual work. So I'm gonna choose a main system, and my main system is gonna be something like this. But this main system is, is, doesn't have any load because the, my original problem doesn't have any load. It has only <coughs> this information. So. I'm gonna put a unit load at the remove redundance. So when I remove this fixation, I told you there's three forces. 
that is X reaction, Y reaction, and moment. But I'm gonna neglect the normal because this, this one is not gonna be called normal. The normal force is gonna be zero. You can put the normal, but it's gonna be a long problem and the force is gonna be zero, so why? So once I remove this, I'm gonna only consider the shear. So I'm gonna put a unit load equal to one ton, like this. <clears throat> I'm gonna put a moment. Let's see what direction. So we can put it actually in this direction, in the negative direction. <coughs> One ton meter. So right now I put unit load at the removed redundance. The, the so that I can find the reaction. So my <coughs> so what I'm interested on, I want to find the reaction here, and also I know that X reaction is equal to zero and the moment here. And once I found them, I will be able to find the reaction here, and I will be able to find the moment here and the X force here. And I know these are zero and this are zero. Actually, as far as I remember, because I, I, I this is fitness matrix, I have worked with it a lot. I believe this is 12 EI over LQ, and this one is six EI over L squared. Same thing here, 12 EI over LQ, and this is six EI over L squared. So let's find out this number, <laughs> they are right way. Or wrong, okay? All right, so I have these two systems. This is the main system, the original system, O, oh, and this is system number one, and this is system number two. Let's find out how we can use this system to solve it using the, the concept of virtual work. If you guys remember, if I have only, if I'm looking only for one reaction, this is the equation. But if I'm looking for two reactions, this is not the equation, because there's two equations. Delta one O plus F one, delta one one plus F two delta one two equal to delta one. And then, then the second equation, delta two O plus F one <coughs> delta two one plus F two delta two two is equal to delta two. So this is the two equations that we need to solve. Sometimes we write them in a, in a vector format, like it's something like this. multiplied by F1, F2, and outside I have delta one and I have delta two. <clears throat> All right, so delta one O and delta two O is gonna be equal to zero, I'm gonna tell you why. So if you draw the bending moment for this one, it's gonna be positive, something like this. And this is gonna be L, because one multiplied by L, so the value here is L ton meter, and it's positive. And this moment is negative, <clears throat> so it, and it's constant because you will have one ton meter like this, and it's gonna be something like that. One ton meter, and one ton meter, and it's negative. So this one is positive, this one is negative. And this one doesn't have anything because there is no, there is no load on the main system. Like I don't have concentrated load, a distributed load. This doesn't exist. So the moment, on this part is zero. So if you integrate delta, to get delta one O and integrate the O system with one system, you are gonna get this equal to zero. <coughs> delta two O is gonna be zero as well, because if you integrate this system that has zero moment with this system, it's gonna give you zero. So let's get delta one one. <coughs> delta one one is the integration of M one with M one over EI DL. You are gonna use the table and then the integrating triangle with itself. So it's gonna be, once you do it, it's gonna be LQ over three EI. And you will do the same thing with two, two. It's gonna be L over EI. And then we are gonna get delta one, two. So delta one, two, you will integrate M1 with M2 over EI. And once you are done with this one, 
is going to be negative. Why is negative? Because this one is positive and this one is negative. So that has a positive moment and negative moment. So this one is going to be negative L squared over 2ER. <coughs> and always delta 1, 2 is equal to delta 2, 1. That's something for sure. So if you, you, don't, you don't have to do the same integration twice. Once you get delta 1, 2, it is the same as delta 2, 1. <coughs> All right. So I have everything. I have these, I have these, I can, oh, I have delta one and delta two. This is the initial displacement at the direction of their most redundant. Do you guys know what is the value of delta one? I want to substitute in this equation. Delta one is the initial delta in the direction of, so like, their most redundant number one. This one, this one I have is equal to one. How about delta two? Is there any rotation? Initial rotation, there is not. So this one is equal to zero. So to solve this equation, it's gonna be something like zero and zero, and then you have plus <coughs> the matrix that has these values, three values, then you put them in a matrix, and then you have F1, F2 equal to one and zero. And you put all these numbers in this matrix. And then you solve two equations and two unknowns, you get F1 and F2. And uh, <coughs> once you solve them, you will find that the value of F1 is equal to 12 EI over L cubed. And you find the value of F2 is 6 EI over L squared. And once you do, <coughs> you do like a statics to solve the sum of Fy, if this one is 12 EI over L cubed going up, so this one is 12 EI going down, so that it can keep uh, the stability. And there is a moment counter moment on the other side in the same direction. So if I want to put them in the matrix, I know that the axial force is zero because there is nothing that triggers axial force. The force number one, K, this is K, one, two. This is K, two, two, K, three, two, K, four, two, and here K, five, two, this one, and this is K6, 2. This is the name of each K. K1, 2 is the axial reaction or the axial stiffness, it's a zero. And then K2 is 12 EI over L cubed. <coughs> and then 6 EI over L squared, and then zero, <coughs> and then negative. 12 EI over L cubed, and then the last one, it's negative as well. Oh, this one is in the opposite direction. Like this one. Once we solve them. So this one is going to be 6 EI over L squared. All right, so I got the second row. Same thing you need to do to get the third row. Like, let's do it one more time. <coughs> so, if you wanna get U3, so right now we got U1, U2, and you want to get U3. We're gonna do the same thing. So what I'm doing right now is just a practice on the virtual work that you are gonna be tested on Monday. Like same thing, like if I want to get number three, <coughs> the rotational stiffness or the flexure of stiffness. Flexure stiffness. Here's my beam. And <clears throat> we're gonna fix all the degrees of freedom. And right now, I'm gonna put U3 is equal to one. What is U3? It's rotation. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna make this support and rotate it with the unit deformation. So I'm gonna have a unit deformation like this. Theta is equal one. This, <clears throat> this is the initial load. 
as far as I remember, when you repeat this with theta equal to one, this is the developed reaction. Verse, there's no axial force. Just you will have a moment here, four EI <coughs> over L, and you will have here six EI over L squared, and a reaction here, six EI over L squared, and a moment here, two EI over L. These are the reactions. How can I find them? I need to use the virtual work to find these reactions because this is indeterminate structure. How? <coughs> same thing. You choose a main system. I'm gonna choose the same main system, this one. I remove this one. Once I remove it, I want to find three reactions. One of them is zero, but I want to find the other two. So it's gonna be same thing. I'm gonna put a unit load at each remove redundant. So I have one time here, and <clears throat> I'm gonna put, maybe I put a positive, or let's keep it negative moment here. One time here. So the moment is gonna be something like this. This is L, it's positive. This one is gonna be positive. It's gonna be something like this, L. This one is going to be negative. One, one time meter. I wrote the bending moment. This is the O system. This is system number one. This is system number two. <coughs> Same thing. You will get delta one O. It's going to be equal to zero. Delta two O is going to be zero. Delta one one. Same thing like this one because you are integrating the same three angles. Delta one two, delta two two, and delta one two is equal to delta two one. So integrate n one, sorry m one. So this one is going here. Integrate m one, m two e l over e i, and here you integrate m two with m two e l over e i. And it's supposed to be the same number like this one because I didn't change anything. I just changed something else, but it's the same. These are, since they are the same, so all these integrals are the same. So this one is gonna be <coughs> L cube over three EI, and this is L over EI. Yeah. And delta one two is negative L square over two EI. So right now you are gonna ask me a question. It's the same problem. What's gonna change? You tell me. So right now I'm gonna substitute in this equation. Same equation. This one. Delta one O, delta two O. So I have these R zeros, and I'm gonna have a matrix that has delta one, two, two one, delta two two, and I put the same values. And here, what I wanna found F one and F two. So what a change? The deltas, right? In this problem, delta one, the one in the direction, this is, was one, but right now it's zero, right? But the other one, it's one, because the rotation is one in the degrees of freedom number three. Like the delta in the direction of the second force Theta is equal to one, so this is zero and this is one. So once you solve this, you will find that F1 is equal to six EI over L squared and F22 is equal to four EI over L. How can you solve it? You'll solve like two equations into one more. Actually, you can expand these in just two equations. You can just sub substitute in these two equations and then you solve them and you get the unknowns. All right, so once you did this, you are gonna have something like this. Zero, and then six EI over L squared, four EI over L, and then zero. And then on the other side, <coughs> negative six EI over L squared, and then two EI over L. Right now, I'm done with half of the matrix. So, let's do this. 
<coughs> this is half of the matrix, and I want to find the other half. And it's asymmetric. I don't have to do the same thing. <coughs> so it's going to be something here. You guys tell me, what should I write? If, if you know that this matrix is asymmetric, so what I'm going to write here? The value here. It's like the columns are the rows. So if you take this column and make it as a row, it's going to give you the same value. So you just put this value here, put this value here, put this value here. This is how you make the matrix symmetric. So this is going to be negative EA over L, 0, 0. And then <clears throat> you take the second column, make it a row. So this is going to be all right, <clears throat> 0, negative 12, i over L cubed, i over L square, 0, negative 6, ei. So if you don't believe it's symmetric, you can go do the same thing. You can go and put u4 is equal to 1, and then find the internal forces, and put u5 is equal to 1, and put u6 is equal to 1, and do the same thing. But it's going to end up with the same solution, because it's a symmetric. Like, if you put this is equal u1, you get this reaction. But if you put it in the other one, you will get the same reactions, but on the other side. And this is the big matrix, the structure stiffness matrix, or the frame stiffness matrix for uh, a member. All right, so in the exam on Monday, you might be asked, derive the normal stiffness of a frame member. So you know, you should be able to know how to do it. Drive the <coughs> shear stiffness. So when I say shear stiffness, so I mean U21 right away. What is the value, like you put u2, 1 is equal to 1. I don't have to say that u2 is equal to 1. Once I say shear stiffness, once I say flexure stiffness, so I mean that u3 is equal to 1, and then you write this whole thing, okay? So you, you, you should be able to know what is the difference between normal stiffness, shear stiffness, flexure stiffness. So, so I, like in the exam, I'm not gonna ask you to develop the whole stiffness matrix, just one column. Either U1 is equal to one, what does it mean if U1 is equal to one? X, normal stiffness. If U2 is equal to one, shear stiffness. If U3 is equal to one, it's a flexure stiffness. So you need to drive this whole thing. I need to see the main system, the system number one, system number two, and then you put the reactions, and then I wanna see delta one O, delta two O, delta one one, delta one two, and all of these stuff, okay? Is that difficult? So this is the derivation, how we drive the stiffness matrix of a member. But we don't, I mean like not every day we are gonna do this. We just like know where this is coming from, and once we know it, we know this is stiffness matrix, and we use it uh, to solve the structures using SAP, using ETAPS, whatever <coughs> you are doing. So, this is the end of the lecture for today. So uh, I believe <clears throat> we got a really got content um, explaining the basics of structure analysis, how we do analysis for beams and frames using uh, also uh, solving indeterminate structure. We got the double integration method, the conjugate beam method, the and then we after the met term we started to get in deep with the structure analysis using software. We use the SAP 2000 to solve the structure, we use ETABs, how to build tool buildings, and then we get back to solving a structure using indeterminate structure. We use the real work, the virtual work, the work and energy method, the stiffness method. So we have lots of combination. I try to make the class half technical uh, with theoretic uh, like methods like the methods that we have been dealing with all over the semester and the other part is the structure analysis using software I know it's a fun part 
actually this course when it was developed there wasn't any software so I tried to uh, make it a little bit fun by putting some software uh, in there and uh, I tried to be supportive as much as I can having notes on canvas recording the classes for for your convenience so I tried to make as much as I can to make it convenient for you and most of the materials accessible to you but if you have any questions related to the Monday midterm exam just reach out I told you the exam is going to include uh, like the I believe like three weeks the first one when we started the real work and virtual work so there will be question or two on these two methods uh, real work <coughs> virtual work what else Method. The flexibility method, yeah. So it was like from, from last week, how to solve structure. So there will be a question on the flexibility method and question on the lecture from uh, uh, last week and a question from the, from the lecture this week, like the one that has the screens okay. and one of these. So you should be able to know all the things on the board. Everything is going to be from the lecture. There will be nothing outside the lecture. So make sure that you check the notes all the notes because out when i'm gonna put the midterm exam i'm gonna look at the lecture maybe it's not gonna be the same question but it's gonna be exactly the same so all what you have to do you know what is this related to the lecture if you click them together you will be able to solve the exam and when you solve the exam don't be abstract like okay you don't write like the final answer i need to su to see steps because if you don't get the final answer right you will not get the whole points. Even if you got it right, but you messed the sum steps, I want to know where this is coming from. So <clears throat> I need to see steps like, okay, for example, you didn't draw any of these, but you draw all of them. How did you got this? Like, how did you get the moment here? How did I see it? So, so definitely there's something wrong. So I need to see bending moments, like bending moment one, bending moment two, and then how you did this integration. Like, don't put this and then made it equal to this number. I want to see it. Like, what integrations that did you do? So I want to see everything so that you can get the full uh, points. We are going to have our midterm <coughs> on Monday, and it's going to be one and a half hour, the, uh, the, same, the same class time, like 9.30 to 10.45. So I'm going to make the questions uh, enough for the time. And then we have the project presentation on Wednesday. So you guys should have all your projects ready. And the presentation is on Wednesday, but you can submit the, uh, the final uh, report maybe two days after, like until December 1st. So if you don't want to submit it on Wednesday, maybe you submit it on Friday. That's fine with me. I don't have any problem with this because I need to submit the grades uh, uh, next week. Okay. All right. So uh, I enjoyed the class with you guys, and I hope that you uh, enjoyed the content that I was uh, like presenting. And See you guys next week. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.